The following game was an, uh, part of the Breakthrough Australian Championship by Greg Hjorth in Adelaide in 1979-80. Uh, this is the tournament where Hjorth finished second above uh, a lot of the top players in the country, including people like Robert Jamison, his opponent in this game. The game was played in the ninth round. Hjorth looked like uh, he was only in the running for second place at this point, and Jamison was one of his uh, main rivals. Jamison was actually playing up to Hjorth, uh, and Jamison, in, in the <clears throat> position we've reached uh, here, Jamison certainly has some pressure. Uh, it's, it's a typical uh, symmetrical pawn structure position where the black bishop on b7 is just a bit passive. These positions can usually be held by black, but as Kasparov showed in his matches against Karpov, they can be really difficult and it, it is completely possible for white to uh, break through and win. So, first of all, Jamison made a, a rather slightly controversial decision to exchange off on e6, to leave black with the isolated pawn on e6, uh, but uh, to also mean that the d5 pawn is not quite so weak. And then he followed with bishop b5. So white's idea is simply to take on c6, dump a knight on e5, and no matter which way black plays it, he's going to finish with a bad bishop against a good knight. And to avoid that, Hjorth came up with a quite remarkable combination. He played rook f8, queen moves away, rook takes f3. So at first sight, this looks, looks like an, an easy sort of combination, the sort of thing you'd see in a French defence. But after bishop d7, knight f3, king g2, it turns out it's a bit more tricky than that. So the combination looks like uh, it, it involves black playing pawn to d4. But unfortunately then after bishop takes e6, king f8, knight d5, all the tactics seem to work out for white. For example, knight g5, you have time for rook c7, and if the bishop goes back to a8, then rook c8 will be checkmate. And if uh, you just have to take on d5, then white's simply the exchange ahead. And I'm sure Jamison was expecting pawn to d4, it's the obvious move, and suddenly Hjorth played bishop h6, and this is uh, a wonderful idea. It's just knocking the rook away, but you'll see why it's important in just a moment. Bishop check, king f8, that's natural enough. The rook moves, and suddenly d4 now. And there's a big difference here. The rook is off the c-file, so now if knight d5, knight g5 really is very strong. And here, after bishop d5, which is what uh, Jamison played, pawn takes c3. And all of a sudden, whether you take on b7 or on f3, white uh, will be faced with pawn to c2. The uh, bishop covers the queening square on c1, and the only person who can win this is black, but probably white can hang on for a draw there. In it, um, well, maybe not, actually. So in any case, Jamison felt that he had to take on c3, and after take, take, Black has two pieces for a rook. Hjorth is a little bit unlucky that his two pieces just aren't working terribly well together at the moment. He tried knight d2, rook d7, a5, with the idea of trapping the rook if bishop, rook takes h7 with bishop g7. Even that is probably likely to be a draw, but Jamison played it safe with rook c7 and uh, exchanged a few pawns, and after a4 the players agreed to draw. Uh, possibly there's still some small advantage here for black, but uh, a, a draw is, is highly likely. In fact, white can start checking on the uh, eighth and seventh rank, and that's probably good enough. So uh, in the end, uh, the players agree to draw. So the combination was only good enough for a draw, but it did ease the pressure that uh, Jamison was building up. So uh, again, tactics solving, solving some positional problems.